I had a terrific upbringing. We lived, Brixton Prison for where I live is just about where that stand is. I used to walk through Brixton Prison to get to secondary school every single day. And the simple message, there was no location, location, location in those days. You know, this was a good location to be brought up because my dad said, if you ever get into trouble, that's where you'll end up. It's that simple. My problem started when my dream came true when I became a professional footballer at Fulham under Malcolm McDonald and Ray Harford. They were the coaches. I thought my dream had, had come true. And on my third game, I played at Leeds United. And in those days, there were 10-foot high fences. You remember 10-foot high fences all around the pitches? Unbelievable environment to play football in. And we were losing 1-0, which we, we, we did a lot in those days. We were losing 1-0, to be fair. And uh, myself and another... Uh, player Paul Parker who played, went on to play for Man United. We were only two black players on the pitch playing for Fulham and we went to run for the ball, picked it up and rushing to take the corner and I looked up and the crowd at Ellen Road with 10,000 people doing the Nazi salute towards me and Paul. Zee ha, zee ha, zee ha, zee ha. And I was 17 years old. And I looked at Paul and Paul looked at me and we both wanted the ground to just swallow us up and disappear. I'd never seen as much hatred towards me in my life. I had to make a decision then. Do I want to carry on? Do I want to, do I want to stop playing? Because that was serious. I, do, I, do I want to do that? And my dad said to me, never let anybody stop you doing what you want to do. <laughs> so I carried on playing. A few weeks later at Portsmouth, I was walking off the pitch. A, a young boy about 10 uh, spat on me. And I assumed that it was his father who was next to him. And everybody in that stand started laughing at me. I went into the dressing room and a lot of the players were really angry that they'd seen someone spit at me. And they came up to me and said, you all right? I said, am I all right? I said, you didn't do that when 10,000 Leeds United fans were doing the Nazi salute towards me. You didn't do that when people threw bananas at me the other day. You didn't do that when people were doing the monkey chant towards me three weeks ago, I said, just because someone's done something physical, now you think there's a problem. All those things have exactly the same effect on me as when I was fat out. They got that a little bit, and they started to understand what I was going through. But I had to keep my powder dry. I had a great career. I enjoyed my career, and I loved the game but I had to keep my powder dry because if I had said anything, it was my problem, it was my chip on the shoulder. It was me who was the problem, not the abuser. So to have a career in football, I had to keep my powder dry. And so I did. Lots of players didn't, and they disappeared by the wayside because of that. And they were better players than me, by the way. My sisters went to my first game at Queen's Park Rangers on a plastic pitch. I don't remember we played on a plastic pitch. And I must say, I was absolutely atrocious in that game. Really, really bad. But I was a striker and I scored the winning goal. And we won 1-0. So I was on the back pages of the sun. Isn't that amazing? The back pages of the sun. Anyway, no, don't clap that. Um, and I went up to the players and I was feeling like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm arrived, I'm here, I'm arrived, yeah, I've been practicing my autograph with a little smiley face as I walked in, so I'm signing autographs as I got in. I'm feeling seven foot tall. And over in the corner of the players lounge, I can see my sisters and my mum and dad and some of my friends. And Linda, the second oldest sister, came over to me and said, Leo, we're going to have to go. Uh, we'll see you back at home. And I said, why? You know, oh, this big day. She goes, oh no, we'll, we'll see you back at home. Don't worry. So I went home. I said, what was the problem? They said, well, while you were playing, the guy behind us was calling you a black this, a black that, a black this, a black that. And they looked around them, and they were only black faces in the crowd. They'd never felt so intimidated in their lives. So when I went up to the players' lounge, the first person to come up and ask me for my autograph was that guy. And they just couldn't, couldn't stay there and not say anything. But they had to keep their powder dry. So for the next 12 years, no one came to watch me play a professional game of football because I couldn't allow it. So I'd be more worried about them than playing on the pitch. I 
I've been busy. I've got five kids. And, uh, yeah, I've been busy. And I'm quite proud of that. And uh, Liam, who's just retired, he's retired. <laughs> he's retired from football, shows how old I am. He finished at Brighton, and he works at Brighton. I'm very, very proud of him. I won't have my kids called mixed race, um, because when you speak to kids, language is extremely important. And don't let anybody tell you about this political correctness not being important. Political correctness is vastly important. And words are important, especially with children. So I won't have my kids called mixed race, because when you imply race, you imply there's more than one race. And there's only one race. Otherwise, you call someone mixed race, you're implying that one of us is an alien. So I call my kids mixed heritage. And when people are going to schools and kids say, uh, how many, uh, ask them, how many skin colors are there? And the kids say, oh, there's two, brown and white. Or no, there's three, there's brown, white, and light brown. I say, well, no, how many people are there in the world? Well, six, seven billion. That's right, there are six or seven billion different skin colors in the world. So when someone's having a go at you because you've got a different color skin, how stupid are they? And they say, yeah, you're right. We've all got different skin color. What a ridiculous thing. And when kids go to school, I try and get them to understand how it feels when you have to put up with racist abuse. And I put, I, discrimination is different from racist abuse, and we could go into that. But I try and get them to understand that when they're at school and people call you a name because you're thin, because you're fat, because you've got glasses, you haven't got glasses, because you're short, short because you're tall, when you're at school, and then you go home and your parents say to you, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, what a ridiculous saying that is. Because when I was playing football, I broke my collarbone, I broke my ankle, I broke my wrist, I broke most bones of my body. I've had 18 operations in my time as a professional footballer. And I've healed. I've healed to, well, to a point. But when I think back to when I was at school, I remember the time when somebody called me a name. I remember exactly where I was, who said it, how they said it, and how I felt. And I will never forget that. So to ignore people calling you names is allow things to fester and grow and be worse. So please don't ever say that to your kids. Get them to deal with it in a really positive way. When my son went to school, because he's mixed heritage, I came up with a problem. He said, Dad, what gang should I be in? What gang should you be in? What do you mean? I'm, I can't go in the white gang. I can't go in the black gang. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, good question. I tell you what, why don't you go and make your own gang? And he said, yeah, okay. So he went away about seven weeks, eight weeks later. I went to the school. I was looking in the schoolyard, and Liam got together with his little brother and his gang. And I know this sounds awful, and it isn't politically correct. But all the kids were sort of like the unfortunate kids in the school. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the ones that looked the most unfortunate ones. He got them all together in a gang, and they were his gang. I couldn't be more proud. When I was playing, there weren't many role models. There's one role model for me called Justin Fashioning. Does anybody remember Justin Fashioning? Yeah, Justin. And I remember the goal he scored the match of the day, and, and it was iconic, and he's lived in my, my mind uh, since that moment. And when I was at West Ham, Justin came on loan towards the end of his career. And Justin was six foot four. Everybody was black, and he, and he was gay. And everybody knew he was gay. And by the way, if I was gay, I would as well, because he was amazing. <laughs> amazing. Six foot tall, muscles everywhere. I, yeah, no problem. Me and him, no problem. But Justin walked in after training, in no clothes on. In those days, we had great big bars. There was no health and safety. It was pretty disgusting, but we had great big bars. And I was sat in the bath with two guys who I would have called friends at the time. And Justin got in the bath, and the two guys got up and walked out. And I knew exactly why they'd got up and why they'd walked out. Now, Justin and I didn't become great friends. He was there for three or four weeks. He seemed like a nice guy. 
and then he disappeared because that's what happens in football. People come and people go. The next time I saw Justin, I was sat home in South London and he was on the news and Justin hung himself in the Elephant and Castle, which is just down the road from me, and he committed suicide. And I thought back to that exact moment when Justin walked into that dressing room. And I realized then I didn't have the education or the knowledge or the nous to deal with that situation in a positive way. And I needed to, and I regretted that. I could have said to those two guys, look, he doesn't fancy you, you're ugly. He doesn't fancy you. They were the sort of guys who might have taken that, might have broken the ice, I don't know. I'll never know. But from that moment on, I vowed that I'd be educated and have the knowledge to make sure that every time something happened, I'd be able to deal with it at that moment in time. Because when you don't deal with these things at the time, they lose their power and you lose an opportunity. And every single one of you in this audience has been in a situation where you, feel, you felt powerless because you haven't had the knowledge or the power or the education to deal with a certain situation. Every single one of you. And you need to get that power and that knowledge and that education because we can make a change. We can make a difference all in our own little world. We can make a change. And it adds up to, a, to being so powerful. I did a speech at Hope Not Hate and there's a couple of an old couple sat in front and I told them that Justin Fashionu story. They, they went off, I saw them about six months later and they came up to me and said, Leroy, do you remember us, we were in London you, you, when you uh, did that speech? It was on a Saturday? I said, yeah. They said, well, we got on the train on the way home and there were some football fans singing racist, homophobic songs on the train. Yeah, what, what, what did you do? They're about 70 or 80, by the way. Well, we got up and challenged them. Well, I didn't mean, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. What, why did you do that? I said, oh, don't worry. It was fine. They stopped and we became good friends. You have to do it, and you have to do it at the right times. The work the show race and the red card do is in incredible. And when I played football as a manager, you know, we, we play the game, we win on a Saturday. By Monday, you forget whether you won, lost, or drew. It was chip paper. You forget about it, you move on. The work we do stays within that school. We go back to schools, and I see it's embedded within that school. It's so important. And it ends up with stories like Hannah on a regular basis. It's the most important work I've ever done in my life and, and I am very proud to represent Show Race in the Red Card when we do it. I think it is, we've seen that we had Wear Red Day uh, which is on the 18th of October this year. It's on the 4th of October in Scotland. I think 60,000 people took part in it last year and raised over £60,000. If you could do that again that would be great. But there are great things going on all around the country around Show Race in the Red Card. But I just go back to my dad, he passed away 10 years ago. And unfortunately, he passed away just before Barack Obama became the President of the United States of America because he would never, ever have believed that that would happen in his lifetime. And I hear a lot of academics who use the word race all the time, who use that, well, racism will never change because racism's been around for years, since the Roman times. They used to be black, you know, they used to be black people who had slaves back in Roman times. We'll never get rid of it. Absolute nonsense. Our kids get it. Our kids will change it. And I aim to change it within my lifetime for my kids' sake and for my grandkids' sake. <laughs> it's amazing to be in Brighton talking to you guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's an honour, absolute honour. I've seen the great work you do all around the country. I live in Bristol, Wales and South West. I know that area well. So I saw that work done there. My partner comes from North Devon, so Appledore. I know Appledore well. I know all those areas well. And I'm a London boy. But I've been all around... I've been all around this country and I've met so many people. And I'll finish with this story. 
I tell the story about why people, why I like to be called black. And people say, oh, why do you like to be called black? And I said, because it's a real positive way to describe me. And I was, many years ago, an old lady said, you know what? I don't, I don't like calling you black. Why don't you like calling me black? She said, because when I was growing up, you had Black Monday, you had Black this, you had Black... It was all negative. Everything black was negative. And she said, I don't feel comfortable. And I said to her, well, you know Rosa Parks, you know the colour, the bus and the, tr and the little story, told the little story. And she goes, I know that story. She said, oh, I get it now. The problem we have with racism is that sometimes we want to label people as being racist for doing something which is ignorant and you have an opportunity. You're told you about that moment of power when you can change people around. That is the moment. When they do something which is ignorant and stupid, and you have to recognize that, that you have to recognize the positives in people. Because if you label someone racist, there's a good chance, by the way, they're gonna turn out racist. But if you can turn them around with education and with knowledge, there's a good chance you can turn them around. Now, if that lady hadn't spoken to me, I know a lot of black guys who would have said uh, they would have walked away from her and ignored her. And that would have reinforced her feelings about black people. We have got to be bigger and better in the way we behave to change this through education and through knowledge. That's what Show Race and the Red Card do. So pleased that the GMB have got on board and in partnership with Show Race and the Red Card, we're going to change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. What an inspirational speech that was. Thank you, and for all the work you do. Um, we've got the red. We've got these cards on your table. Can you all stand up, turn round, hold them up to the balcony, and we'll have a photo shoot, please. That concludes Congress for this morning. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming early. You've just got time to get to the fringe events. We've gone over a bit, but that was worth, you know, that last bit. Um, see you this, back this afternoon at two o'clock. Thank you.